we have our last John instalment for this series. And we have the privilege of reading together John 17. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that He can give glory back to you. For you have given Him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given Him. And this is the way to eternal life, to know Him, the only true God, the Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on the earth by completing the work you gave to me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me so they may bring me glory. Now I am departing from this world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as scriptures foretold. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am asking you to, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice to them so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them just as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed them to you and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Beautiful. Good morning again, Morena. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. Such a great time of worship this morning. We find ourselves at the end of the series, John 17. We began in John 13 with Jesus washing the feet. Then we entered what is known as the final discourse of Jesus, His final words, and we get to the end of that discourse, which pivots from teaching or conversation to prayer. And uh, all of this is about us getting ready for Palm Sunday, which is next week, and then ready for the Easter, uh, Easter weekend so that we can enter the story all over again and hopefully experience in some way, shape or form the death of Jesus and all that that means and the resurrection of Jesus and the life that He gives. And, and we wanna enter it and celebrate it and honour Him so that it would stay front of mind for us and the life that's in it would continue to flow through us. And so here's our, our final bit of the series as we get ready. And, uh, and, and, and in this one, 
as I've already alluded to, a shift is taking place. We're gonna begin the teaching today just by being a bit of a Bible geek, okay? You know I love the Scriptures. You know I love to see interesting things in here. But, but this is a pivot, right? This is, this is a shift. Jesus is not teaching His disciples right now. He's praying to the Father and we get to eavesdrop. I love that. We get to eavesdrop in. I remember being able to eavesdrop in on some of my parents' conversations as a kid, right? And sometimes that wasn't that pleasing, but other times, you know, they were talking about what maybe we were gonna do tomorrow that was fun as a family, right? And it'd get you excited. Or maybe you'd overhear a conversation around what the buying for my birthday or something, you know, and you'd get to eavesdrop in and it'd give you a glimmer. Sometimes you get to eavesdrop in conversations and it actually helps guide your life. I don't know, maybe you've heard your boss say something to another colleague about you and be like, if only they would do this. And then you, you realise, oh, I better go away and do that. Right, and it sort of helps you, it guides you. This is a little bit about what's happening here in this conversation with Jesus. We get to hear a conversation between Jesus and the Father. We get to hear a private, personal intimate conversation about the desires and the prayers of Jesus' heart. And we get to listen in and go, oh, how can we play our part? How can we partner with the Lord in the answer to these prayers? And so it just the flow here, there's sort of three parts to Jesus' prayer, just in case you're wondering. It, it starts with a prayer, if you would, that the Father would be glorified. This is why Jesus has come, to reveal the Father and glorify the Father. And so Jesus' sort of final thing, is, it's, it's not like his deathbed final talk. It's more like a brave heart, his final run out onto the, onto the battlefield. You know, as he's about to go die on the cross, I pray, Lord, that my purpose would be complete and that you would be glorified. The very reason I've come, to reveal you, to glorify you, I pray that that would actually happen. You can imagine he's, he's facing a, a tough 24 hours ahead of him. He knows what he's walking into. Tough is an understatement. And so he's, he's praying that his father would give him the strength to do what needs to be done. And then he pivots, he prays for the apostles. He prays for the 11 disciples that are still there with him. Uh, and, and he prays that they're gonna be okay when he goes, he entrusts them back to the Father. He goes, well, you, you've entrusted these 11 with me, Lord. I lost one, uh, but I, I got 11 still, and now I give them back to you, Father, as I go, they're now in your hands. And then he pivots and he prays for all believers, for all time, including us. Jesus prays for us in this prayer. He thinks of us. He's mindful of us and He lifts us to His heavenly Father. And this, this whole chapter 17 is the pivot point, or it's really the climax of all of John's gospel. I said we're Bible geeking for a moment. This is the moment. This is the, the pivot point. Jesus has been doing miracles. Jesus has been doing a lot of teaching. John's gospel contains all the longest formats of Jesus' teachings. All the miracles are intentionally placed to tell us something about the nature of God that Jesus is revealing. And this prayer is the pivot point from the end of all of that ministry to the passion story and his death, burial, and resurrection. In this prayer, it's hard to pick up, but there are words and allusions to every conversation Jesus has had in the 16 chapters previous. Every sermon he's given, every teaching moment finds a little thread that pops back up in this. It's beautiful. It's amazing. On first glance, it's amazing, but as you dive in deep, you're like, oh my goodness, this is genius. This is a pivotal turn. Jesus finished chapter 16 in verse 33, and he says, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. You know, we were praying before, just point, side note here. We were singing the song, God, you're never gonna let me down. Always a tough one to sing. I don't know about you, I felt let down by God many times. I feel let down by God right now. But it's a faith statement to know that in the end, 
God will never disappoint you. That his hope is worth enduring for. That he has overcome the world. And yes, you may feel disappointed by God on the way, but his hope does not disappoint. And our hope is ultimately not in this life. He has overcome the world. So take heart because I've overcome the world, Jesus says. And then he's about to go to the cross and overcome it. He's about to plunder hell, take the keys to death and release eternal life to all who would believe. And I love too that in back in John chapter one, verse 18, it says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son is himself God and is near to the father's heart. He has revealed God to us. And now we skip forward to verse, to chapter 17 and we see Jesus once again, still near to the father, saying, I have done it, I've revealed God to the ones you sent me to. And in that, Jesus summarizes his entire ministry and we should not lose the the reason why Jesus came. Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. You wanna know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. You wanna know what God thinks? Listen to Jesus. You wanna know what God feels towards you? Look at the cross and the love and salvation offered for every single one of us. It is no longer a mystery what God is like, what God feels towards you, and what God thinks. Jesus has finished it and revealed it. It is done and dusted, full stop, end of chapter, end of book. It is done. He has revealed him. And there's some beautiful requests in this, in this chapter, in this prayer. Man, Jesus prays for protection over the disciples and a safeguarding of what we'd come to know as the church. Jesus prays for authority to be given to his, to his disciples, that they would be commissioned as witnesses, that they'd be set apart in this way for the special work of God. We're all set apart. I'm not the only one in ministry here. We're all in ministry set apart for God's purposes. And Jesus prays for the success of the community that would become known as the church. There's a big observation that strikes me. I've got two big observations for today. The first one is this, is that Jesus does not entrust the church to the apostles, but to the Father. This is a big observation, right? Like This is his final spiel, And you would expect he would get his 11 that have survived together and be like, guys, I'm going. It's gonna be a big deal. It's on you now. It's on you now. I've been training you. It's all been heading to this moment. Peter, come here, Peter, Peter. It's on you, man. Like days coming in about three weeks time, five weeks time. Uh, You're gonna do a big thing. It's gonna say, Paul, Paul, you know, like, John, where you at? John, I need you. No, that's not what Jesus, Jesus does not entrust the church to the apostles. He entrusts the church to his heavenly father in this prayer. And I think that is really, really good news. That is really, really good news. Jesus could have given it to anyone because it was given to him, but he gives it back to the father. And I think if he didn't give it back to the father, it still wouldn't be here 2000 years later. Because we ain't that good. We definitely ain't that good. And church history is a mixed bag. And there's no way it would have survived if it was left on the shoulders of the apostles. Don't get me wrong, as leaders, we have a stewardship responsibility, but it's not on me. It wasn't on Peter, it was always on our heavenly father. It is his church. It is his grace that sustains it. It's his word that gives it life. It's him who said he will build the church. And so I just, I just love it. It's easy to miss, right? Oh, this is God's thing. Not our thing, not your thing or my thing or anyone's thing. It's the Father's thing. It was given from Jesus to the Father. And I think that's pretty comforting. What about you? And the second big thing that sticks out to me in this is that a theme that runs through this whole thing is a prayer for unity a prayer for oneness, 
a prayer for the unity of the Father, the Son, and all believers to somehow be in a dance of love together, experiencing the unity that is in the Trinity, that the believers would be brought into that unity and would experience that between them and God, but also between each other. It's hard not to miss that, right? That, that is the major theme of this prayer. And here's where I need like a little sidebar, a little disclaimer, because everything I say from this point, somebody's gonna be tempted to either think that I'm saying it because we're about to have a special finance meeting this afternoon, or I'm saying it because some people have left the church, or I'm saying it because of whatever, or I'm saying it about particular people. Nothing I'm saying is about any of that. I'm preaching the word as I see it today, okay? So, what does, we're first gonna say, what does this chapter say about unity? And then we'll just zoom out and be like, what does the rest of the scripture say about unity, okay? What does this chapter say about unity? This chapter says that our unity comes from God's unity. Our measure of unity is God's unity that he has in himself in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he's not looking for us to create unity as much as he is for us to be brought into unity, if you would. There is already a unity exists that exists. We're asked to learn to live it out by the grace of God. We're not creating, it doesn't start with us, it starts with the Father. The second thing this passage says about unity is that our unity will complete God's work in the same way that Jesus' life and death and resurrection completed the work given to him. That Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. And when we're all in perfect unity, we too get to say, it is finished. That that is the work entrusted to the church. The third thing it says about unity is that our unity will be a witness to the world. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, you love one another. In this, the oneness, the unity is the witness. And the fourth thing is this, is that it tells us that our unity is sort of like the incarnation of Jesus itself. That our unity makes visible the tangible love of God. Our unity incarnates the love of God to this world and so Jesus' prayer is that we truly be one with him and one with each other. And so hopefully we can agree on this, church. Jesus cares about unity. Can we agree on that? Yes. That Jesus cares about unity. And if we are disciples of Jesus, if we are, as we put it in our vision, pursuing the way of Jesus, then we need to care about what Jesus cares about. If Jesus cares about unity, then we too must care about unity. The early church, at least, seemed to capture a bit of this unity. In, in Acts 2 verse 1, it tells us that they were all meeting together in one place in prayer. That's where God pours out His Spirit is on a room of about 120 people in unity. In unity. I want more of God. Get in unity. That's where God loves to pour out His presence. In Acts 2.42, and they were all devoted to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to fellowship, and to the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper. They shared with everyone who was in need. God did miraculous signs among them, and many were added to their day. That's my paraphrase there of the last bit but they were all devoted, they were all united. And man, there was something powerful happening there. Acts 4, unity, unity. But then you like open the book of Corinthians and I don't know where it went wrong, but somewhere in the story, it went a bit pear-shaped. The early church captured God's heart, but over time, like all good things, humanity comes into play. But Paul, you, you can't read a single letter of Paul where he is not calling for unity. Just some examples, 1 Corinthians 1.10, be of one heart and one purpose. Galatians 3.26, don't you realize you're all one? Philippians 2 verse 2, can you agree wholeheartedly? 
Just to give some examples, or 1 Corinthians 12, don't you realize that you're all a part of one body? Yes, you may be different parts, but that doesn't mean you don't need the other parts and that you aren't a part. In other words, learn to get along. I think Paul knew what we know and what Jesus prayed for, pretty hard for the world to take notice of a divided church. Pretty hard. Church beginning in the Roman Empire, if it was ever gonna make a difference and make it all the way to the palaces, it had to be united. I think of it like this, you know, when, when 20 people protest, you know, down in the town square or whatever, nobody really takes much notice. Even if you do care about the thing, you don't really take much notice. 20 people could be, you know, in this town square, in that town, they could be. But then when all those movements get united, and they can agree on a couple of things, and all of a sudden they're all singing from the same song sheet and chanting the same thing and have the same signs, then all of a sudden there's like, and you're like, oh no, this is a whole movement and they are all united around these things. And then all of a sudden you're like, we gotta take notice. Whether you agree or not, you take notice. And I think that's part of why Jesus was saying it's a witness to the world, not just that it reflects God's heart, but also that it's how the world will take notice. I think I've been thinking about unity a lot because um, people have been leaving the church. Um, and that, that's gutting. There's a weird thing in Tauranga too where people seem to move around churches like no other city I've ever seen. There's some weird stuff. I'm, I'm gutted because some staff have left and I don't, I don't want to, none of these comments are about any of those people, but it does give, surely it should give us all reason to go, well, what does it mean to be unified? What does that actually look like today? And so let's, let's zoom out and and see what else we can learn about unity. I guess if Jesus prays for it, and Paul instructs it, and in Psalm 133, God blesses it, the Tower of Babel tells us that even if you're united against God's purposes, almost nothing's impossible for you. You should probably figure out unity. We should work it out. I think there's two main ways we need to think about unity today. That's what I felt to speak about. One is unity in the big C church. What I mean by that is unity across God's church, across the globe. Unity from this church to that church to whatever church in our city, in our nation, across the world. We, Jesus is praying for unity across his whole church. But we also need to think about unity within an individual fellowship or church, small C church, a big C church and small C church in this case, curate. And uh, I, I think we should acknowledge just on the outset that unity is hard. Unity is hard. Um, unity in marriage is hard. And that only involves two people. that's at least started off really liking each other, being romantically attracted. And if in that environment, unity is hard and not every marriage survives, how much more so the church? We know that unity is hard in families. Even when you share blood and DNA, keeping unity across a family, across generations is really difficult. Unity in a sports team is difficult. Unity in a business is difficult. And here's what I want to say is that even when you throw God into the picture, it doesn't make it not difficult. Many Christian marriages fail. Many Christian business partnerships go south. Many families who all love Jesus can find themselves fractured. So just because we're believers doesn't mean unity is going to happen. Let's just acknowledge that. That it's something we have to work at. It's something we have to fight for. It's something we have to figure out if we're gonna do it. Just in the same way, no marriage ends up strong and unified by accident. Nobody's born or gets married and at that day has every tool they need to do that. You have to figure it out on the way. The same is true for every church. 
So, me, I, I think we should also acknowledge this because I just don't want people picking holes unnecessarily in it. Church comes in many shapes and forms and I think that's all good. There's home churches, house churches, big churches, small churches, cathedral churches, Wednesday night churches, Saturday churches, Sunday churches, there's liturgical churches, contemporary churches, traditional churches, modern churches. I think God's good with it all. As long as it's about Him, and I'll say more about that, but as long as it's about Him and His purposes and under His Lordship, it's not about the form. It's all God's church. But... We must acknowledge that how churches have divided has changed in all of our lifetimes. Churches used to divide on theological lines. Okay, so people passionately believed certain things about what the Scripture revealed, about what it meant to revere Christ, to honour Christ, to form the church, and they believed them to the extent that they were willing to divide over some of those things. That's change, and so you end up with Baptists, and you end up with our brethren, and you end up with Pentecostals, and you end up with different streams of Pentecostalism, and then you end up with the Anglicans and the Catholics, and you end up, and all of this stuff, all of the traditional divisions are on theological lines. And we might have many things to say about that, um, both good and bad, but at least it was on theological lines. At least it was like people studied the scripture and thought this matters enough. I'm so focused on honoring God that I'm gonna die on this hill. Not all of it's good, I'm not saying that, but just it's a lot easier to respect than what a lot of modern day division is. A lot of modern day division, and I'm not talking about anyone here once again, a lot of modern day division is more about style, about preference, about who somebody likes as a teacher or doesn't like, about worship convenience, worship time, worship location, or these sort of quite personal what I like and what works for me things. I think at a big C level, one of the most encouraging things is there's more of an appetite to get along than ever before. I think it's awesome. Like I work with a lot of pastors across a lot of churches. There is always an increasing camaraderie between us. Even from when I started in ministry 18 years ago to now, there is an increasing camaraderie. There's a willingness to work together, to help each other, to celebrate each other, to cheer each other on. There's less of a comp like competitive thing. There's a lot more of like, hey, what can we agree on and can we get together on that? And I, I think that's awesome. But it's interesting that while at a big C level, I believe the church is becoming more unified, at a small C level, the church is actually becoming more divided. That within individual fellowships, we are seeing more and more and more division. And that's because what you are willing to divide over determines what you unite over. And if what you were willing to divide over is, is fickle, or is not very strong, then it's not a lot to hold you together. Is that making sense? So if you're willing to divide over theological lines that you believe are God reveal, God whatever, and that's what you end up uniting with the community about, that this is what we believe about communion, this is what we believe about worship, this is what we believe about church leadership, woman's role in the church, whatever these sort of secondary issues are, if you're willing to unite around those things, it's actually quite a strong bond. But if you're uniting around it works for me, <laughs> eventually that tether will break. It's not a very strong rope. It's called, community is what is common unity. <laughs> the strength of the community will only be as strong as what you're holding in common unity. And so, while the big C church unites, I'm afraid the small C church seems to be dividing because the lines have changed. That's my observation. 
And so what is unity? That's a good question. Sometimes it's easier to say what something is by figuring out what it's not. Unity is definitely not uniformity. Unity is not there being one single institutional leadership structure that rules all of the churches. That's not unity. Unity is not all thinking the same way about everything. Unity is not having the same liturgy as everyone else, the same worship style, the same even eldership structure or leadership structure or way of going about church or ministries. That is not what unity is. Unity is not thinking the same on all things, but it is thinking the same on some things. As Augustine, the great theologian said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty, freedom. And in all things, love. What he was trying to distinguish is that in our Christian journeys, not everything's a hill to die on, but some things are hills to divide on, right? And so we end up with a a way of thinking, and this might be a helpful tool for us, is that there are primary issues, secondary issues, and if you would, there are tertiary issues. Primary issues are what Augustine is saying in essentials unity, What are the essentials in unity? The Apostles' Creed would be the the easiest summation of what the essentials are, the confession of what the church believes about the nature of God, the nature of Christ, a little bit about the nature of salvation and the nature of the church. This is the confession. It's very simple. If somebody, primary issues, that's the confessions. If a church does not believe, and it doesn't mean they have to confess the creed, but does not believe the confessions of the creed, it would be fair to say it's not a church. Because this is what the church has always believed. And so we're not looking to unite with people who don't believe in the primary issues because they're not part of the body of Christ. Is this making sense? So it's like we unite with the Presbyterians We unite with the Baptists, the Brethren, because we actually all believe those things, but we do not unite with the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons because they do not believe in the same nature of Jesus. And so it's not anything goes. Primary issues we need to unite around. Then there are secondary issues. An example of a secondary issue would be women's roles in the church. It might be how a church should be leadership structured. It could even be on the exact nature of salvation. These are secondary issues. And we don't need to agree with the church down the road on secondary issues to be united because they're not salvation issues. So we don't need to agree. We can agree about what we agree about and then we can happily disagree in that space and still be united. Is it making sense? But in an individual fellowship, there probably, a small C church, there probably needs to be a level of agreement around secondary issues because they do affect how you go about church together. And if you're not on the same page, there'll always be division. They're not salvation issues, but they are walking together issues. Unless two are of one accord, how can they walk together, the scriptures say? And so there is a sense that to be united within an individual body, actually there does need to be some wrestling and agreement with secondary issues. Tertiary issues, that's like, it doesn't even matter. Uh, An example of a tertiary issue in my mind would be uh, your theology on end times, how the ends come about. I know, there's a few little chuckles there, eh? Uh, You know, there's a full spectrum of, of beliefs there, I don't think it really matters for how you walk out with your brothers and sisters in a daily experience, in my opinion. So odd class is a tertiary issue, even in an individual body. We can disagree on that, still love each other, still serve the Lord together, work together. Following me? You might like hymns and I like whatever. Yeah, it's a tertiary issue. So um, hopefully, hopefully that helps. So I think for there to be unity at the big C church and at the small C church level, Actually, most of the ingredients are the same, and I've put it down to five things. I think you could add more, but here's just five, top of mind. The first is, is that we need agreement on, the, on primary issues if we want to unite across Big C Church, and secondary issues if we want to be united in a single body. We do. We need to hold to those things. The second is, is that we need to come under the Lordship of Christ together. 
Churches don't get united by trying to tune to each other. They get united by tuning to Jesus. Okay, it's like if I wanna you know, create a symphony of a hundred pianos or even a, maybe a better illustration would be a thousand instruments. If I wanna create a symphony of that, I don't first tune the guitar, then tune the piano to the guitar, then tune the, you know, whatever, go through all the instruments, that it's eventually all gonna get out of tune. And when they play together, you're gonna hear like, yeah, they're playing, they're trying to play the same song, they're playing different notes, but they're not quite in tune. But if you tune them all to the same tuning fork, they will all be in tune together. Jesus is our tuning fork. The Presbyterians might be playing an octave lower or an octave higher, but if we're all tuned to the same fork, we can play the melody of Jesus together. And then the third thing is, is that we need activated love towards one another. And I wanna say activated love because it's easy to speak love, it's harder to act love. We don't just need niceties, we need practical help either within the body or also between bodies. We need activated love. I love there's a good example of uh, in, in the cyclones last year in the Hawke's Bay, there were a bunch of churches that we as a church gave generously to so that they could care for their people and care for the community around them, even though we don't necessarily agree on secondary or tertiary issues, we agree on primary issues, and so we can activate love towards one another and be there for each other. Support, help, all of those sorts of things. The fourth thing is, is that we need to appreciate our differences. We need to appreciate our differences. One of the worst things we can do if we wanna have unity is to think that we are better. We are not better. We just are different. We're different. And there is a river of God trying to pour a witness into the world and we are but a stream, right? And, and as Charismatics or Pentecostals, we do certain things well and other things really not well. And then as the Anglicans, they do certain things really well and they've been around for 500 years, we should probably give them some Jews. And they do some other things not so well. Nobody has the complete answer, but if we can value our differences, then hopefully our streams, sometimes our creeks or our trickles can come together and form the river of God that is the witness to the world. No different than within a body, we want to celebrate our differences. A lot of conflict in church, I heard it said this way, is not moral conflict, but it's gift conflict. We all have different gifts, and therefore different ways that God has graced us to see the world, and therefore things that we think are more important than others. But often it's not moral issues. Often like, it's not about one person's right or wrong. It's about one person's a hand and so sees the world as a hand. And the other person's a foot and so they see the world as a foot. And the foot matters and the hand matters and the tension needs to be managed as opposed to the whole church to become a hand or the whole church. It's gift conflict. It's not right or wrong. It's, oh, you've got a shepherding heart and so you think that's really important. And you've got an evangelistic heart and so you think that's really important. You've got a prophetic heart so you think that that's all important. Everybody thinks their thing is the silver bullet for the revival of God. It's gift conflict. It's not one person's not right and the other wrong. We just have got different pieces to bring together. And so within a body, we need that. And then the, the last thing here that I think applies to both is that we need to speak well of each other, pray for each other and cheer each other on if we wanna have unity. I, I could add one more thing in a, in a small C setting and curate is that, that we would need mutual submission and mutual honour to have unity within a body. The Bible is very clear to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Unity will not happen unless we're willing to leave some things behind. <laughs> I'll go there because it's the 11 o'clock. It's not submission if you agree. That's agreement. Submission is what's required when we don't agree. 
And the Bible says that we should all submit to one another, be willing to lay things aside for the greater good. And so we need mutual submission to happen in the church, but I think mutual submission should always be coupled with mutual honour. And mutual honour is about recognising the God touch on each person's life, the wisdom, maybe the role, maybe the gifts, maybe the anointing, And if you couple mutual honour with mutual submission, I think it creates a beautiful dance of unity where we submit to one another, but we also recognise that like we all have something quite different to bring to the table and the more value and honour we give it, it actually makes us better. Really, the tough part about unity is is that it requires a heart attitude that flies in the face of our sinful, broken selves. It doesn't happen without the grace of God in our lives. It doesn't happen without perseverance through difficult times. For the two to become one in marriage, something of the two must be left behind. Something has to die. When I married Katie, the single man had to die so the married man could emerge. Right? Yeah. As we are believers brought into the body of Christ, something of our individualistic nature must die so the unity of the body can emerge. If you're not willing to die, you'll struggle to live for Christ for your whole life. And so I just started reflecting on some of the things that need to die in me and what needs to be reborn, some of the old self that needs to constantly be taken off and some of the new self. Some of them may apply to you too. Pride in me needs to die. It rages war against unity. And humility needs to be born. Preference. Or put another biblical way, selfish ambition rages war against unity and the heart of the servant must be born. Rebellion must die and submission must emerge. Cynicism or distrust, spirit of our age really, it must die and trust must be born. Conflict avoidance in me must die, and courage must be born. Scoffing or a lack of honour must die, and the heart to honour every person must be born. Get real practical now. Gossip must die, And speaking well of or to the other person must emerge. And we could add many other things. But without these, unity will never happen. Lord, help us take off the old person and put on the new Christ person. Let's finish with Psalm 133. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in harmony. It's the word for unity. We could add symphony. For unity, for harmony, is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's beard, over his head, ran down his beard, and onto the border of his robe, It's that precious. It's it's as precious as the anointing of God is unity. It's also as refreshing as that dew that falls on those dry mountains of Mount Hermon. It falls on the mountains of Zion. It's as refreshing as those beads of water emerging in a dry, barren place. And there, where's the there? With his unity, with his harmony, the Lord pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. We must all admit, unity takes work. And without the grace of God, 
and a willing heart, it won't happen in our midst. But shall we pray that Jesus' prayer might be answered in our midst? Our Lord Jesus, our Heavenly Father, our Spirit of God, we have such reverence for you and for your church, and we recognize it's not ours, but it's yours, and it bears your name and your purpose and your mission. And God, we need you to work in us so that we might be able to fulfill the prayer of your son, Jesus. Help us strip off the old person in ourselves. Let the new person of Christ constantly emerge. And may we be a lighthouse of unity. May we be a pillar of unity in your body as a whole, and may we be a great example of unity within ourselves, Lord. That feels like a long way from where we are. But we open ourselves up, each as a part, to say, lead us and direct us so that we might all play our part in fulfilling your prayer. In Jesus' name. And for his glory. Everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen.